Um, I'm Trey. Um, uh, grateful that you, you know you came. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to talk about the project. Um, I always think it's a good place to start out by just giving thanks. And there's a lot of people in this room, to be honest, that have made this project happen. I mean, I never, I didn't do this with, by myself. I mean, Charlotte was amazing with the grant writing. Ellen provided tons of feedback and a lot of support and ideas and she worked all summer with myself and two other students. Um, the special collections staff at the very beginning Gene and I was like Gene what am I getting myself into? Um, so I, I just am really grateful to all of you and all the support and Lori digitally it's just been a lot of support and I appreciate that. Uh, so the project is uh, 2T Junidelo Guasti Unino Heila uh, and 2T is the name of the community Snowbird. Uh, 2T Yi is the place of the snowbird. Uh, Juni de lo Guasti is basically schooling, and Unino Heila is basically stories. And it roughly translates into stories that Snowbird Day School students tell. Um, and may, maybe you know this, but this is, this is a joint partnership uh, between UNC Asheville, uh, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. I mean, they gave us a, a decent amount of funds to get this project off the ground. Um, almost matched the Whiting Foundation fund. So I think at the end of the day, it's about a $100,000 project. Um, the Snowbird Community Library, which Wendy knows very well, um, has just been amazing. They've digitized a lot of stuff and have been unbelievably supportive. Um, and then the Juno Alaska Museum, all of the materials uh, that you see around us, um, we created for the reunion and those are all going back into the community. Um, and so it's just been an amazing, amazing project. And, a lot of relationship building and a really beautiful partnership. Um, obviously it was supported uh, by the Whiting Foundation and just really grateful to be a part of this group. I, I totally felt out of my league. I went to New York this summer and man, they were some amazing academics there. It was pretty humbling to be a part of it. And if you are a faculty member at UNC Asheville, I would really encourage you to apply. It's, it's been a really amazing program to be a part of. So I, I want to start, um, there's a lot of moving pieces to this project, but I want to start with one of our final products. Um, and this project is still evolving. Uh, I think one of the questions that we're wrestling with is what to do with it now. Um, really the community, the pro this project started by the community just wanting to do a reunion. And they came to me and they, one of the members came and asked, you know, Trey, can you help us organize it? And I said, well, I mean, I, yeah, sure. Um, but I think there's a really amazing history here that we should think about recording and preserving. Um, and so one of the ways, and one of the questions that we're dealing with is how do we then take all of the stuff that we've collected and this knowledge and we return it back into the community. So one of the things we're, we're, we're working with the tribe is to create a documentary. Um, and this was done during the summer by one of our UNC Asheville students, Samira Zubi, uh, who is a former Kent, uh, techno media student. Yep. Um, and we were on a crunch line because we, we did a reunion for the school August 4th. Um, so this is a trailer for hopefully a full-length documentary. Um, I just want to play for you. What did you think of the school? I mean, when we first came? Yes. Well, I thought it was one of the prettiest places I've ever seen in my life. We had been for an interview, gone for an interview with Mr. Jennings, the superintendent of the agency. This is December, early December 1949. And uh, he, he wanted to hire not only Al, but both of us. So he, he suggested we go down to the school and look it over. So we drove down there, it was January, December day, and oh, we looked around and said, oh, this is so beautiful. I think I could work. About where the white tree is, the white car, there was an apple tree. That's where Jimmy Brown and I climbed in. And right about where the red car is, there's gas pumps. And the teachers would allow us to pump the gas. And it was a <laughs> hand pump. What, yeah. were you, what were you pumping the gas for? For the bus. Jesse Crow, 
No, Jack, you lose ten nine. Got yet to go, huh? The lonely gates got here, eh? To land, okay? Eh, the lonely gates you got, huh? The lonely gates, the lonely gates, huh? Mm-hmm. Not there. No, no, so, you know, it's a goose, huh? Eh, to land, he can now goose out to this guy. Mm-hmm. So, they road, husband and wife here. The Lees. They were from Tennessee. Her name was Louise. Louise Albert. Now, <clears throat> when they, they were all small, real nice. They were really nice. Mm. Wow. We had teacher days. It took me just a few months to learn how to write my name. Print my name. We knew how to write alphabets and all that stuff. And how to read. All that stuff. Do the spelling. We did. Well, I did learn a lot from them. Mr. Lady, Jaguayona, no less. God, football. I go go to a quanta football. So, I yell to me. Uh huh. Guess no less. Hector will square to one with pads. He's going to wear a pack of washes. So, I'm going to do it. Uh huh. I want to know, um, well, the doggy goalie at home, Mr. Lee, Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn, I want to skin a hun, uh, oh, the girl, and it's an all in uh, uh, poetry on this go school, that goalie, it's go, oh, so I could not ask you, uh, I can look to the ski, you stuck, uh, 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 a uh, nutcracker suite and home. Uh-huh. Skin on uh-huh. all it. Skin on uh, classical music. John Disco. Skin on you love to know. Lena her no. In high school. Skin on you go to a year ago. Lena her. Get his tired as that year gets him. Uh, he got tired ago. Lena her. His lady. He got that year gets him. Now he knows. 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 Now he <laughs> we had a big playground to begin with. They had some old, well, Jesse and Al fixed some wooden, they got some big, cut some trees and had some posts and made some swings. And then probably about three or four late years later, they got a merry-go-round and they got the big slide, the biggest slide. In the country. We have- merry-go-round beside the lunchroom. We had seesaws on the other end of the lunchroom. We had a big set of swings over our We had monkey bars over our we had a big playground out there where we could play and run. We had a creek we could swim in in the summertime and spring over there. And we had a big slide over there. It was probably 15, 20 foot high, or probably 25 foot high up there we could slide down. But we had a lot of fun at that playground, monkey bars and stuff over there. How long is it? The boys can You can get shut up, can you? You can get shut up, can you? You can get shut up, can you? You yeah, before we left, the sixth grade going to Romsville, uh, Romsville's oh. kids came, the sixth graders came, and we had what we call like a May Day, and we'd play softball and volleyball, and we'd go swimming and have a picnic together. So we could kind of learn each other and make new friends. Been the hardest question, which is, why is it important for us to remember, in your opinion, there's no right or wrong answer, but why do you think it's important that we preserve the history of the school? Probably because my children, and even Esther, my younger sister, and my grandchildren will never experience that. Um, we had a bond there, even uh, just the six of us. It was uh, kind of a bond that we knew we were there for each other and, and we talked to each other and played with each other. And it was, it was just different, different than, and it kind of went away after we got to public school, we kind of were spread out and we didn't have that closeness anymore. So it's kind of sad. 
and I think my boys didn't get to experience being with the Indian children and neither did Esther. I mean, she did up to a point, but it wasn't like going to school with them, uh, learning with them, reading with them, uh, having music with them. I don't, it's hard to explain if you've never sure. got to experience it yourself, you know. It's hard, it's hard to tell people, but I miss it. I mean, I wish people could experience it. I mean, it was nice. I mean, it wasn't as like the one Daddy and them talked about at boarding school, like what they had up there, you know, because they were left there. We were here. Any any thoughts about that? It took four years from the school. Yeah, so the school opened in 1935. Um, and the 30s are, are interesting uh, in terms of a federal Indian policy because most people know that in the 30s uh, there was a New Deal. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize, there was also an Indian New Deal. And FDR hired a guy named John Collier. And um, Collier was pretty sympathetic. Um, and he really had the idea of taking the government out of native business. And his legacy is a little bit mixed, but he's responsible for really, I think, two fundamental changes. One is he ends the allotment period. Um, so 19th century, I won't go into that, but it impacted my family out in Oklahoma. Uh, but in terms of schooling, he phases out boarding schools. Um, and so Snowbird Day School is a part of a larger reform piece. And they're trying to bring modern education to Snowbird. And it had been pretty sporadic up until that point. And then the school closes in 1965 because of desegregation. And so the students are pushed out into the larger public school system. So Trey, you might clarify the geography. Yeah, yeah. yeah. people know. <laughs> I'll skip through this. This is all minutia. Uh, so this is uh, the community. Uh, if you've never been over there, I mean, from Cherokee itself, it's another. It's an hour, uh, depending on who's driving. I have made it in 45 minutes. I'm proud to say. Woo! Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Depends who's driving. Uh, from here, it's a good hour and 45 minutes to two hours. Um, I mean, it, it is isolated, and I think um, it is definitely a piece of the community's identity. Uh, and they were able to resist in ways that Cherokee couldn't because of that isolation. Um, from a historical sense, it's, they refer to it as Chio, uh, Otter Town. Uh, other people refer to it as Buffalo or Buffalo Town. Um, and it was, I mean, even, I'll show you this map right here, even in a historical sense, this is what is Snowbird now. Um, I mean, it's isolated even from the other main pieces of Cherokee Towns. Um, and that's just a unique cultural f feature of this community. Does, you know, uh, any other, any other questions? When you said they resisted in different ways, what other examples? Well, just in terms of like the school, right? The bureaucracy was intense in Cherokee because it was right. The, the reservation principal was there. The, the reservation superintendent was right there, and so those schools uh, had the intensity of the BIA. Um, Snowbird, like there, when we started digging into the archives, like Mr. Lee would get in trouble. He was really my kind of administrator because he would get in trouble for all sorts of things. Like he built a closet because um, they lived on campus. So he built a, a, a closet in the, the living quarters. And so we found all this correspondence of the BIA reprimanding him for that because it's federal property and you can't alter you know, federal property. And he just would do it anyways. You know? I don't think he could have gotten away with stuff like that in Cherokee. You know? So uh, they resisted and did different things because of their isolation. Uh, how far did students come from So most of the, the students at Snowbird, I mean, so when we talk about uh, historical efforts at schooling, I mean, the boarding schools were, like we were just talking about Chilaco today in class, which was out in Oklahoma, and the local kids didn't go to Chilaco. Uh, they bust people or ship people basically from thousands of miles away to remove them from their home communities. This is a day school. So we do have oral histories where um, there was f physical punishment. Uh, it usually came from uh, substitute teachers, but there's, we have an oral history of one of our students. I mean, they didn't speak English. I mean, they did, yeah, they didn't speak English. I mean, they were all Cherokee speakers. And so one of them didn't know how to use uh, a toilet. And so she saw a, uh, what is that, drain hole? And so she thought it was where you went to use the bathroom. So she went and used the bathroom over the drain hole and the teacher, just came and started like, you know, screaming at her and then grabbed her and she, the person, Shikonage, Shikonage, her skin turned blue. Um, but she was able to go home and tell her mama. 
And her mama showed up at the school and, you know, that didn't continue. <laughs> that didn't continue. Any other questions before? Well, Snowbird was the Cherokee more prevalent in Snowbird, the speaking uh, the language. Yeah, so I think one of the unique pieces of this school and of this project is the high concentration of Cherokee speakers. It is, at a, even in Oklahoma, it's one of the highest concentration of Cherokee speakers out of all of the Cherokee communities. And so you can see, like, one of the conversations we've been having is we recorded these oral histories. The problem we're having is to translate them into English. And so I actually kind of like the fact that they're not translated, that it forces people to, to sit with it, which makes people uncomfortable, some people, but even Cherokee people. Um, when we showed it at the reunion, it was like, what's the feedback? And they're like, man, you need to translate the interview so we can hear what our, our parents or grandparents are saying. I don't know, maybe. But the hard part is finding people that, that can actually do it. Uh, there was a project in the community that this is somewhat based on uh, 30 years ago called Fading Voices. And uh, they did a special edition for the Journal of Cherokee Studies, and they took those Cherokee interviews and translated them into English. But that was 30 years ago, so they had that many more speakers to be able to do that. Uh, we're down to less than 200, you know, it's like 175 people that speak. And were some of them speaking English because they had forgotten or because of Dakota or somebody was asking them English questions? Well, like uh, Ethel, I'm the interviewer. And so I don't know what a lot of is being said, too. I'm not a fluent Cherokee speaker. So she's being respectful to me. Um, but some of them, you know, they lost it. You know, to be honest, I mean, she she can speak a lot. She can understand more, but you know, she went there as a Cherokee speaker, and she she lost it. Yeah. Any other? I appreciated that you didn't translate it because you can listen to the language. I feel like I get very distracted with reading subtitles and listening to voiceovers. So I actually really appreciated that about. Cool. I think the elders in the community appreciate it. I mean, if anything that they've really attached to is just being able to put on some headphones and listen to the language being spoken. Um, I think it's been a real gift to them, unexpectedly. I'm confident all the instruction was in English, but the Lees know enough Cherokee to communicate with the students who are native Cherokee only speakers. How did that work? Yeah, good question. So the Lees are really interesting. So, you know, the school's open for 30 years. In the first 15 years of the school, they had 15 different teachers. They could not keep teachers. Uh, they would leave in the middle of the year. They wouldn't return. Uh, I think a huge part of that was the isolation. So the Lees were at the University of Tennessee, and they had a Cherokee neighbor. Uh, and um, he said, uh, Mr. Lee said, I want to teach. And the guy said, well, you should go check out Cherokee. And so he and Mrs. Lee drive down there. And she has a baby on her hip. And the superintendent hires them both. She didn't even get out of the car. And the hope was that by hiring a husband and wife, they would stay. I've asked a lot of questions about did they learn the language, and I think they learned enough to get, ba get by. Probably like Shio, which is hello, or Shiguju, which is like how are you, but they, 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 they weren't fluent speakers. What they did do, and one of the unintended consequences of this project, which was really interesting, is the community wanted to make them honorary members of the tribe. And so we had this reunion on August 4th, and there was this really interesting conversation about and they wanted to bestow it upon them. So Mr. Lee, so 1965, the Lees are transferred out to the Navajo Reservation because they're BIA employees. He ends up passing away in Gallup, New Mexico. She survived till May of this year. And amazingly, all of the stuff that, that we collected, they were going to throw away. And they heard about the project and turned it back over to the community. Um, um, what was I talking about, Jeff? What was I talking Oh, oh, yeah, so honorary, they're going to bestow honorary uh, primarily because they felt like the Lees encouraged them to speak and allowed them to speak. So they were able to speak in the lunchroom. They were able to speak on the playground. And they, they were really allowed to speak except when they were getting direct English instruction. And um, I was really nervous about that. Um, and Ella Bird, I don't, you saw her in the, if, if you recognize her, we, UNC Asheville gave her an honorary degree two years ago. Her daughter came to a meeting and said, you know, um, Snowbird's never given an honorary title, and I don't think we should do it. <laughs> Conversation ended. <laughs> so, uh, but, but they are very beloved. Um, and for the reunion on August 4th, the, all of their kids came back, um, which was really cool, really cool. But they didn't learn the language.
Were they, were they given things that they gave back to you, like artifacts or gifts or I thought I heard you mention baskets. Or yeah, um, so this picture right here. So, so this project, we, we ended up with 474 photos. Um, when we started it, they didn't even think we would have 50 or 60. Um, but what was really cool was when we started getting some, we started getting a lot. Um, and they came in the form of envelopes, plastic bags, shoe boxes. Um, and obviously we cataloged them um, and whatnot. But this picture is really interesting. We identified everybody in the picture. And um, Mrs. Lee, because a lot of this was depression or post-depression, would pay women in the community just so they could have money to make her baskets. And so we posted this on Facebook, because we have a private Facebook page. And her children saw it and said, you know what, we have some of these baskets. So when we had the reunion, they brought the baskets back. And they repatriated them back into the community. Yeah, it was really neat. The other thing they brought back, and I didn't know what it was, um, Mrs. Lee was so uh, beloved by the women in the community, they made her a blanket as a going away present. And they all um, sewed their names into it. And it's, it was like in pristine condition. And so they brought, the family brought the blanket back as well and repatriated into the community. I think I have some pictures on my phone that I'll pass around of the um, quilt. Gee, uh, where, where are the books? You want to pass those around? Oh, yeah, so in the back, if you get time, uh, one of the things we did is um, we published books for the community. Um, we have 474 photos, but we had committee that chose uh, their favorite 200. And so one of the questions was, is we're doing all of this digitally, how do we get it back into their hands? Because most of the people there don't have internet, except at the library. Um, and so we ended up publishing uh, these books for them um, so they could see and feel the photos. Um, other other questions? What status are, um, is there unfinished status for all the cataloging or, or dealing with all these materials? So we, we haven't collected another photograph. So we, we do have a database. Um, we've archived um, everything. Um, we have five different collections. We have built a website. Um, the biggest issue right now is we have over 1,400 documents. So we went down into the BIA archives, I'll show you really quickly, um, in May. And I took two students with us. Um, and the BIA has all of the records for all of the day schools. So we walked away with like 1,300 documents. Um, and they're really cool. Like the one on the left uh, details how much it costs to build the school, which is about $8,500. We found a handwritten bell schedule. Uh, which was really cool from 1951. And this was really cool. Uh, when people started seeing what we were collecting, one of the community members had this in his family uh, Bible. And this is his first grade report card. Um, and so we digitized that. Um, in a very Cherokee way, he got a lot of flack for his art skills, just, <laughs> not, just, just to let you know. Um, but we haven't had the time yet to go through it all and make sense of it. Um, so we're kind of struggling with that piece. So that's probably the biggest chunk right now, are the documents. So those materials be here in the special collections, or the only thing we've given back to special collections is the book itself. Um, we have so one of the issues with this project is um, one building trust, um, particularly around digital materials. So we've built this website, um, which I can show you really quickly. Um, it, we had to password protect it because the tribe uh, was very fearful, to be honest, of researchers accessing the materials and then usurping tribal IRB. And so we created a password protected site. And it's, it's really beautiful. I mean, it's a cool site. And it has all of our images. It has all of the oral histories. Um, but we, they have not given us full permission to release it. So th th this has been one of the trickier issues. I'm thinking that they will, or you're not sure? I think if the community members see value in it, they'll put enough pressure on them to do it.
uh, the biggest issue is that tribal IRB. Um, that's the biggest issue. That's the biggest issue. Other, any other questions? Yeah. Well, see, I'm not even sure if this is a question, but you know, when you think about Indian boarding schools, how horrible they are and how sort of decultured and sort of secularized in many ways. Um, but everyone who I've seen sort of speak about Snowbird is just the, really just an overwhelming fondness. Um, so clearly they didn't uh, restrict them with their, uh, their identity. So in the so we have a VHS tape. That's kind of what you saw, which we had to convert digitally, and that's Mr. and Mrs. Lee. And he talks about early on being there and disciplining the students, um, and the community not reacting very well to that. And I think that pretty much ended that. Um, we do have stories of him fighting some students. We do have some stories of like things being thrown. I mean, it's not a perfect story. Um, and we also have to keep in mind that our interviews are coming from a certain segment of the of the population that attended the school. Like we don't have interviews with people that attended in the, the 30s or even early 40s. So most of the people that went that we have talked to are late 50s and 60s. Um, and they love the Lees. They love particularly Mrs. Lee. And they felt like um, one, she taught them how to write cursive, which they really value. Uh, and two, they that she believed in them. And so they have a real fondness. And I think the story of the school is not just a school but a community place. Uh, because the men would come on Sundays and play volleyball. Um, the women would gather and do potlucks and, and different events. So it was not just a school. It was most certainly a gathering place. And they just have a real fondness for it. Um, if we get a lot of horror stories, it's when they were pushed out into the white schools. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the conversations we had is we hosted the reunion at Robbinsville High School. And there were people that said that they would not come when we decided to host it there. So the, the, the memories were not great of the, the public schools. Any, any other? This is more of a discussion than I intended, but it's great. Any, any other questions? So I'll show you just a few more of my, uh, the pictures that we collected that are some of my favorites um, and why they are so. So this is one of the earliest photos that we collected. This is 1954. Um, and one of the stories that came out is um, how they got to school. Um, so I don't know if you saw the cover page, there was a bridge. So a lot of them walked to school and they had to cross the, what they called the hanging bridge. Um, but some of them were bus, particularly in the 50s. Uh, prior to this, the stories that we got is they were taken to school in military vehicles, troop transports. So it wasn't until the 50s where they actually had, uh, you know, a bus. Um, and they, a lot of the materials talk about how much it broke down and how unreliable it was. Um, in 1957, they got a new bus, um, and they were really excited about that. Uh, this is the basket picture. Uh, the other, like, I think materials that are really cool is we got shoe boxes full of these two-by-two two Kodak slides. And so I had to buy a special can, uh, uh, scanner to digitize them. And what was cool about these is the community had never seen them. Uh, and this is Frida Rattler, um, and her granddaughter goes to school here. And I was in class, and these were, and I just said, look at these photos. And this was the first time that this student had seen her grandmother in this way and just started, like, you know, weeping. Uh, and I just, I mean, I adore that photo. That's a handmade dress. Uh, and because of that, she was chosen to represent the county in, in the state 4-H fair. Um, and, you know, it's just a, it's just a beautiful, I, I just, a beautiful picture. I mean, I also intellectually think about it, 1950s, this is the height of John Wayne. Uh, and the pushing out of stereotypes, and that just cuts against all the stereotypes, particularly of Native women. Um, the monkey bars, I mean, there's tons and tons of stories of them playing on the playground equipment, and I think there's a general consensus that if it was today, all of it would be illegal. Um, um, I mean, you can see the slide. I mean, tons of oral histories about how they pushed each other off the slides, and people, you know, just, they had a lot of fun on the, on the playground equipment. Um, and we identified every single person on that slide, which was really cool. Uh, this is a really cool um, photo for me personally. Jesse Crow was the maintenance man. Um, he was the bus driver. Um, his, his granddaughter is now the principal at the Cherokee Immersion School. Um, but there are lots of stories about horses. And the kids felt like when they were walking to school, the horses were always chasing them. 
And so we found a few pictures of horses, and this is one of them. And so there's been a big mystery about where this horse is buried in, in Snowbird. Um, but a lot of the early years, they, they, they had a huge garden um, and a lot of gardening stories. Um, and this is a picture, this is another picture that the community had not seen. Uh, that's Ella Bird. Um, and she was 13 years old at that time. And her family saw that and was just was like, wow, blown away. So obviously the oral histories, um, you know, we interviewed, we have, I think, 35 interviews uh, now. 29 of them are in Cherokee. Uh, obviously the archives. Um, and then we had a reunion and we presented as much of it. And so that's what these boards are. Um, there were all of these photos, we hadn't identified most of the people, so when they came into the reunion, we had blown these up. And you can see the sticky notes. So they spent time, like an hours, just identifying and telling stories, and, and then we recorded those, those stories. Yeah, it was really cool. And so like I said, we, we published these books, and then at the end of the reunion, we had guest speakers, and we showed them the little documentary trailer. And then we brought them all together on stage and we gave them books. Um, and this is an amazing, I don't know, Ellen was there and she can maybe talk about her experience being there, but I don't know how to really communicate w what being there meant. Um, but you don't have that many Cherokee speakers together in one room. And those are the elders of the community. Um, and so what I learned through this project, it wasn't just simply about digitization, uh, it was also about healing. And so I think that, you know, that was sort of an unintended consequence at some level, the amount of healing, the amount of sharing, the amount of love. But I, I don't, Ellen, can I put you on the spot and just... Well, I, I agree with everything you said. As, as, an, as an outsider, um, observing the reunion, and, and it's like any other huge family reunion, like the Ramsey family reunion in Madison County, where you get hundreds of people. But, um, you know, they all sort of gathered in their own little sort of family groups or cliques at first. And the real coming together, I think, was after the meal when they went into the auditorium and they saw the, the uh, trailer that you all saw. And then um, uh, uh, Mr. Crow spoke and uh, uh, several other people spoke, including one of the, the Lee's oldest child the one that was a baby when the leaves were hired. And their, their, um, uh, what was really interesting was that their, their friendship, um, I can't remember the first name of Lee, um, uh, the, the Stephen, David. Is David, David, that's right. Uh, and, and they, they both, uh, both Mr. Crow and, and David Lee, as they spoke about their friendship as children, um, they brought tears to everyone, including themselves. It was it was very touching. Um, but I was asking Trey later, had they really kept in touch over the years? And apparently, you know, they they hadn't. Not even sort of the annual Christmas card thing that used to happen. Um, but they had, you know, they they knew sort of where each other was. But to to hear them talk, it was a, a it was a, a family um, a, a feeling. There and and I think that after that, with the community and then the pictures being taken, there was more of a feeling that they were all one big community. But I wondered how often even the the former students saw each other. Um, some of them moved away to Cherokee, and and there was apparently a little bit of a you know sort of a tension between the people who moved away and the people who had stayed. And yet, um, that, that tension did seem to ease as the evening went. Yeah, yeah. There were several people that had moved to, moved to Cherokee, and really the community felt like they had lost them. And so they came back for this project and for this reunion, and they felt like they had reclaimed them back into the community. So that that was definitely a part of, part of the healing. Uh, other other questions? I mean, I definitely have bounced around more than I thought I would. Um, yeah, we, so other ways we used um, digital tools, we did have a private Facebook page. Uh, Wendy was, a, I think, Wendy, you were part of it. Um, and so a lot of times we used it just to help us identify people. Um, and so Facebook was a tremendous tool. It's how we kept up with the, the community up to date on what was going on and what was happening. Uh, the other thing was learning how to use Instagram. 
Um, and what's been cool, really cool about Instagram is, I mean, we're getting people from Hawaii, we're getting Alaskan natives, we're getting uh, indigenous people from New Zealand that are following the project. Um, and I didn't really know much about Instagram prior to this, so I post a picture about a, a week with a little caption. And it's been pretty cool now to see um, who's liking them and who's sharing you know, stories, and it, it's really neat. That, in the upper right-hand corner is the blanket they sewed for Mrs. Lee when she left. Um, so I, I do want to just talk about this really, really quickly. So I, I think one of the um, elements that was very um, much embedded in this project is an idea of, in the Cherokee community, community what they call gadugi. And gadugi is a historical term. It, they used to be free labor societies. And so it could be around funeral rituals, it could be around cutting wood, it could be around feeding people. Um, but it, they were free labor. And anybody at any point in time in the community could call Gadugi. And the whole community, men and women, would show up. Um, that was also deeply embedded in Cherokee politics. Um, and I think at some level that piece has been lost. But what's been really, really beautiful about this project, I think, is the spirit of Gadugi was, was really present. We had volunteer labor doing everything identifying pictures, organizing the reunion, serving food, all sorts of things. Um, and I think it's a really interesting question, you know, do, can Gadugi exist in a digital age? And what does that even look like? Um, but it's the community coming together for, for um, positivity. And I think that this project in some ways really embraced that idea. I'm going backwards now. Um, any other just questions? In some of my research, um, yeah. I came across something in Cherokee that was a free labor group. Is that using that same concept? Yeah, possibly. I, yeah, possibly. I mean, I think Gadugi fits into a much larger Cherokee cosmology. And I think in Snowbird is really unique because there's so many language speakers, and Gadugi, like, um, is, I think, a central aspect of the Cher the Snowbird community. Um, so I think it's definitely present. Um, like in all of Cherokee, there are community clubs. I mean, Big Cove has a community club, Birdtown has a community club, Paint Town has a community club, Yellowtown has a community club, and Snowbird does. And those are sort of the backbone of the Gadugi system. Um, not everyone participates in the same numbers as it used to, um, but I think it's definitely present. Um, I think it's definitely present. Any other questions? Thoughts? What's next? Yeah, what, what's next? I don't know, um, to be honest. I mean, I think that um, the tricky part is the community really just wanted an alumni, uh, a, a reunion. And so we accomplished that. Um, we have this website. Um, I don't know what we're going to end up doing with that. Um, we've talked about doing a children's book. Uh, we've talked about turning this into a larger um, documentary. Um, the Journal of Cherokee Studies has said that they would create a special edition on the Snowbird Day School. Um, so that's going to happen. Uh, we have undergraduate research happening. We have a student that's looking at food at Snowbird Day School because um, there's some really interesting stories around food. Um, they pretty much loved it um, except for the liver. Um, I didn't like that. And they, uh, Dakota's grandmother was the chef. Um, they called her the chef. Um, so I, I really don't know at this point. Um, I, Gil wants to collect more oral histories. Um, supposedly there's more photos out there, but we haven't seen them yet. Um, and then maybe we write a book. Maybe we write a book. I don't know. Any other questions? I appreciate y'all coming. Um, I thought, you know, I had planned for this to be a little bit more linear, um, but this, this is cool. Um, you know, I don't know what else really more to say about the project, unless you have questions. I have a question yeah. Um, you speak Cherokee from um, the Midwest, is that correct? So, the, um, yes, I'm, I, I'm an enrolled member of Cherokee Nation, Oklahoma, which dialect is most closely associated with Snowbird. 
oh, you can get an elder from Snowbird and an elder from Cherokee, and they can't understand each other. Um, at least some of the words. Um, same thing with Oklahoma, but the, the closest dialects are Snowbird to Oklahoma. Um, I speak very little. Um, I speak what I can. Like my students always ask me, why do I speak? I mean, I speak, I think, for three reasons. One, as a form of resistance, um, to be honest. Two, as a recognition of the land that we sit on. Uh, and three, to, to be able to practice, uh, to be honest. Um, and it's, you know, when I, I did a humanities lecture uh, the other day, and there were people from the community there. And so I wanted to use the language as a recognition of their presence. Um, but I would never, ever claim that I, I speak or I, I would never do that, you know. I don't know that much. Yeah. No? Well, well, I don't know. Thank you for coming. Yeah, yeah. I, w I would invite you to, I mean, the books are beautiful and it has a ton of the pictures. I would really invite you, if you, if you have the time, just to look through some of the books. Um, or the larger photos around. Thank you.